All right. So I thought um, it might be nice maybe for uh, both of you to kind of give, give our listeners a, a little path that you you followed as your own on your own careers as as youth to get us started. And, and I know we had some questions ahead of time and I'll take questions as we go and just let you let you both kind of talk about that for us. You want to start? You're shorter. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> My stuff, I'm older, so mine is going to be long. going to go on forever. <laughs> um, I started writing when I was six. I'm from Maine, uh, Gorham, Maine. Um, I grew up at Vienna Farm with Tanya Rennie, who a lot of you probably know. I was with her for 10 years before I moved to Sabine's Farm. Um... I leased a few horses before I got my own. I did all of the NIDA things, the symposiums and the fall festival and um, got my own horse in 2016. And I did the junior thing, went to NAYC in 2018 with the region 18, which was super fun. Um, and yeah, I've done a bunch. I've done a lot for um, you know, as Karen said, with Region 8 going to the USDF convention and being the youth liaison for a while for NADA, which I'm sadly no longer, but um, <laughs> <laughs> would it wouldn't really be fair being on in California, but um, Josie's doing a great job. <laughs> yes, she is. Yes. Um, that's pretty much it. There's not much. <laughs> You went to Aachen with the program too, right? I did, yep, with yeah, the Dressage really Foundation. Too. Yep, with the Dressage Foundation. I went to Aachen to spectate for a week, which was amazing, um, with three other young riders. And um, yeah, that was a really cool experience, which we can talk about later maybe. But um, just getting to see all the riders and meet a lot of people there um, was really, really inspiring for me. Yeah. So, that makes me feel like really old now. If I have to start <laughs> how I started, that's a little longer. Sophia got done, done in two minutes. Um, so I started riding, I want to say like around 10 or 12. And my sister took me to the barn. Um, she quit riding. In the meantime, I got stuck. Um, and Germany is pretty small. So... I was able to really be very independent from, you know, the time schedule from my family. I could just ride my bike to the barn. So it became really, looking back, really a lifestyle. I mean, I spent way more hours at the barn than at home. And I always joke that I was more raised by horses than by my family. Um, but it was really fun because it was a group of girls. Um, one boy <laughs> and I'm still friends with him um, that we were all together and riding the ponies and it was a really cool program very um, versatile so it wasn't just dressage jumping everything trail riding a lot of horsemanship things and um, my family wasn't we were three kids so when I would ask can I have a horse it was always well then your sister wants this and your brother wants that so no um so I was trying to figure out how I can further my education and then decided to um do a three-year apprenticeship with Jan Bemelmans um he luckily lived in the same town where I grew up in Krefeld and um that was, well, I learned a lot, of course, but I have to say before that I had the opportunity and took a little bit maybe a more unusual way um, from a gentleman that was in the same barn as the pony club I was in. He was the first to import Frisians and Andalusians from Spain and Holland. And he wanted to make the, both breeds um, known as riding horses. So we did a lot of exhibitions and he taught us, he put us out there with different trainers. I went to Holland to Mayerlein Kilstra. She taught me how to teach horses to bow, to lay down and sit on command and rear and Spanish walk. 
those things um, from my boss at the time. He uh, drove a lot, so I had the opportunity to learn how to drive horses and got my silver driving badge where you have to um, drive a foreign hand. Um, and then just to promote the breed, we had to get creative and find ways how to make it entertaining. So we just, you know, rode side saddle or we did ride and drive where you ride one and you drive one in front. Um, we did lots of quadrilles with like six white Welsh ponies and six black Frisians. And the same with the Lipizzans from Lipizza. So that was a little bit what I also did once I got to uh, outgrew the ponies. And so then it was a little bit different for me going to Jan and be in that world. And I think I wasn't ready for that. So I, yeah, I really didn't feel that was my place to continue. And I wanted to go back and have fun. Um, so we did that and we did a couple of bigger things like we did a tour over two years with the Lipizzans from Lipizza doing just exhibitions with them that was super interesting. Um, then we partnered with a retired circus family because they had all the equipment, the tent and they knew how to run a circus on the road and we created a show kind of like Cavalia here. And we actually were the first to use a, um, is it called a projector in the back where you, yeah, where you kind of, it was a time travel um, with the horses, what the horses did in each time, um, you know, like in the medieval time, they were doing jousting, Western time, they did trick riding and um, Baroque time we did the more dressage high school stuff and so on and so we traveled with that show for a while and created that show and then um I went to I always wanted to travel but that's hard with horses <laughs> so I um, was looking for a place for my very first horse which was a Frisian and um, I didn't know how to provide a retirement for him. So before he got too old, I, when he was 12, I sold him to a gentleman in Texas. And um, he offered me a job. And since I would love to travel and see different countries, I immediately took the job, took my, brought my now husband along and two horses. So I did, I worked at Proud Meadows Frisians for seven years as a head trainer there. And we had um, stallion testings for the Frisians. Um, so that was super interesting. And then I, um, I, I went to Florida to compete and I brought my trainer in from Germany. I love learning. That was always like number one for me. But my coach from Germany took on the coaching position for the Spanish young rider. So he couldn't come anymore. So I was thinking I should go east or west coast to continue my education. And um, so I decided California. So in 2005, we moved to little north of Los Angeles. And um, then I started my own business. Gosh, I'm old, it goes yeah, on and on. Yeah. Trying to <laughs> like, I'm trying to really be fast. <laughs> um, so yeah, then to California, my own business. And then I started slowly to veer over into the, towards the warm bloods. Um, yeah, I think that's it in a nutshell, kind of. Well, it's really fascinating, right? Because you both have such different paths to come to where you're at. Um, yeah. you know, uh, we have some questions from members who are curious. Um, do you see in each other or, or the pros and cons of, you know, Sophia, maybe a more traditional pathway. Um, Sabine, you went, you know, kind of off into the exhibition riding. Do you see the pros and cons in in the careers that you've established for yourselves now where you know where, where's the the kind of push and pull there that of the two different experiences could you speak a little to those i definitely wish i had done a, i love i love my everything that happened and i don't have any regrets but i do wish i had done a little bit more 
different things when I was younger and it was maybe easier and more accessible and I wasn't so busy like jumping or cross country or you know things like that would have been fun um but now it was pretty much all dressage for me since the beginning I think you know with what what happened with Sanseo because really Sanseo was the one that put that Olympic thing in my head <laughs> um I think at one point I was a little bit or even uh, leading up to that of course you know when I saw that how good he was and the success we had I remember often saying to my husband I should have started that earlier I think it's always a little bit maybe I, I love what I did too and I don't regret it but seeing that I'm like gosh maybe I should have started earlier but he reminded me and always says no that's that you know the path I went is who I am made me who I am so I think I learned to embrace that and not be so it's a little bit my personality to think oh maybe I should have you know <laughs> instead of saying no that's home, <laughs> why I am who I am now so yeah I mean I think I think also he reminded me that um of course, you get a little bit fascinated when you see the success and you think, oh, maybe you could have done that with a couple of other horses. But I really, it really made me think that doing all these different things, there's a lot of like horsemanship stuff involved that I really appreciate. I learned and a lot of um, also instinct things, because when you're young, as I get older, I as I get older, I realize more what I have done. And when I was young, I didn't think about it. It was just like, you just do it. So it's, no, it's good. It's all good. Looking back, I would take the same path now. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, kind of to build off of that, we had some questions around, um, you know, everyone wants, of course, we're lucky in dressage that the riding is fairly structured and you you know when you're making improvement and where you're headed that way a little better than do you have recommendations in the horsemanship or the management or the off of the horse skills that prove to be really important uh in your careers that maybe people don't talk about as much as you wish they would um i mean for me for example i can say because i grew up more with the you know these different things but i thought i learned later in life maybe what sophia is witnessing now what is what what goes into having an international horse i yes jan bemermans was that but i was too young i didn't really understand i just looked a little bit more at my hours and what I had to do and then I went back to my friends and did the fun stuff <laughs> um so it has all like I think that's super interesting too and I had to learn that later in life and I had to learn that with Sanseo really the, I mean with him I learned what what does it really take and that was super interesting and I learned a lot here in Wellington um what that takes um but what was the question again? <laughs> the, maybe the specific skills or things that you did learn. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I think like, you know, we're talking young rider. I do think it's really important when I see nowadays often programs and it even starts uh, changing in Germany too. I was very surprised when I went back. I went a couple of years ago. I took Sensio for two months. And I could see a little bit, I could go back and see what's happening in Germany. That whole, how do I say that horsemanship, a lot of that goes away. I mean, like I was, you know, I remember like yesterday, there's a hierarchy when I learned like, oh, so now you get to pick the horse. And I was, I remember like yesterday, that was, I don't know why I don't, I thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> and to cool down a horse and when I went back I went um, in the area where I'm from so I saw a lot of uh, friends from pony club and we were joking we're like you remember the first time we got to cool down the horse from so and so and it was actually the boy Torsten is his name and he's like yeah that's not happening anymore nowadays nobody wants to cool down a horse <laughs> so it's a little bit that 
um, and and just the I, we were talking the other day too in the tack room also like riding not so good horses. Somebody said one time not so long ago to me that to their student that it would be a waste of time to ride not not a good horse. And I disagree. I'm really also very happy because I did it because there was nothing else. And it was always, well, let's see what we can make with this one, you know? And I, I, I don't see that so much anymore, but I think it also comes from all the online stuff because I can imagine like, then you see, you know, your friend is doing that or so-and-so in Germany is already doing that. Well, we didn't know, like you just, so I can see that it comes with a little bit, I think the negative part of connecting more in the world. It also obviously has amazing aspects of it that we all learn so much more, but that's one aspect I think I see a little bit nowadays that I'm glad I had that riding not so good horses and making them. And I still, I'm 53, I still come from a school and been taught to develop gates. And nowadays with the way these horses are bred is, I mean, you don't really have to develop great uh, gates anymore. Um, so that's something I'm incredibly happy that I learned and I feel comfortable knowing how over time I can make that happen. So, and sometimes I feel a little, um, I don't know the word, it's not sad, but like, I, I can't find the right word, but that you don't see that so much anymore for the younger uh, up and coming writers or generation. I was gonna say you're, you're um, I'm getting a lot of messages directly in the chat from not young riders who are thrilled to hear that, you know, those of us with the very difficult horses are still doing something useful. <laughs> so that's, I mean, it's good to hear that that's always an yeah. opportunity for all of us. Yeah, and I'm I'm generalizing. I mean, of course, I know I still see a lot. I'm just in general and in a broader way saying, yeah, it's it has changed a little bit. But. And Sophia, how about you? You more recently kind of making the change from you know out, out in the East Coast to, to you know a very different environment. What kind of skills did you find in this transition that were very useful that you really didn't see coming? Maybe. Well, I have to say, I'm really glad. It's going to sound like an advertisement, but I'm really glad grow, <laughs> I grew up in Tanya's barn at Vienna because the standard of care for every single horse was so, so high, you know, starting from when I was very young. And so now I feel like it was a lot easier for me, I think, to take care of Senseo well, learning, you know, those skills and having them very cemented in a young age, have, doing things to a high standard. Um, and also just knowing that everything's important, all of the aspects, even if it's maybe boring. Like for me, farrier care was sort of just like something that the farrier did and I didn't really worry about it when I was younger. And now I'm learning a lot more about it. And it's just really important to absorb all of the information that you can and um, know that even maybe if something doesn't seem so important at the time, if someone's giving you the information, it's probably worth holding on to. Um, and also like we were talking about with being, learning all sorts of different kinds of horsemanship skills, Lendon's program, which is for kids that I'm sure everyone knows about is very helpful for things like that, being a well-rounded equestrian and um, learning all that you can. That actually kind of leads to one of our other questions that had been submitted was, um, are both of you, there, we have young riders who are looking for very specific recommendations of, uh, you mentioned the dressage foundation got you over to you know to Aachen to see to see things what um what helpful resources you know Nita obviously we love or otherwise um did you find really helpful to to get your education where it needed to be definitely the dressage foundation was huge um not just for going to Aachen but also I've had a few other scholarships and also you've had some scholarships from them too mm. um mm -hmm. And that's something that everyone should really be applying for. And I feel like I talk about that all the time. They have, I mean, it just takes going to their website and looking it up. They have so many different scholarships available for so many different kinds of riders. And really there's something for everyone on there and no one's 
not good enough to apply for a grant. Um, dressage for Kids is the other really, really, really big one. Um, just so much to offer if you just explore their website, um, clinics and programs and educational events and all sorts of opportunities. Um, and then the USDF website, honestly, you go to the homepage, you click on the big purple button that says youth, and that brings you to everything you ever need to know about youth dressage in this country. All the programs, dressage foundation, really everything you need is right there. Um, it's pretty accessible, which is really nice. And Sabine, are there any uh, programs that you've noticed, um, you know, that, that have kind of caught your eye education wise across the country that um, yeah, I don't know so much with the youth, but I've done the second time also the Robert Dover uh, Horsemanship Clinic. I think that's really cool. Like, you know, um, that, that I, I, again, I did it the second time as an instructor. I thought that was super cool. I think in general, Wellington, if you can um, um, get down here with somebody, you know, a friend or a trainer, or even just to come and, and, and uh, for a while, you know, maybe not everybody can afford it, but come here for a week or something or a long weekend. There are so many, with COVID it has slowed down a little bit, but I remember before I heard, oh, so-and-so is giving a session on health care or you know different trainers come in and so just wellington itself again i learned a lot here dressage foundation for sure i super agree i got two grants and i mean amazing i think they are a huge huge part in uh, my success with senseo very very big part um and which one was the other one? There was one more I was thinking about, but I forgot. It might come to you later. We can, we can move on and come back to it if you remember. Um, there's certainly a lot of questions to choose from here. So um, we have got uh, a question for both of you. Uh, what are you most excited about in 2022 regarding your journeys with your horses? What are, what are kind of your next steps that you're looking forward to this year? I'm excited to get a horse. <laughs> I'm shopping. And yeah. I'm excited to watch them compete in <laughs> yeah. all over the world. Yeah, you haven't seen really. Yeah, it's kind of also, it was a, uh, I think a strange time for Sophia to come in because she came in when I left last year. Um, I worked for you for two months and then you left for two yeah, months. <laughs> yeah, so she really caught me at a busy time. I think on one side, it's probably interesting to see how it all goes down. But on the other hand, I think at the beginning, I, um, yeah, the two months we worked a lot together. And then when I was gone for a month, we still were able to do a lot of pick some lessons. But definitely a little bit of, in one way, strange time, but probably also interesting. Um, so what am I excited about? Yeah, just continuing with Sancio and coming back out after a longer break and now um, um, trying to, to um, what's the name I'm looking for? Trying to, uh, yeah, and but also face the challenge of, producing again you know there's a new pressure like and people always say it's more pressure and yeah but I have to say I that crosses my mind but it's also exciting because I love riding him and so I'm like no like you just you're just gonna enjoy it and do your you know do it well hopefully so and we're trying to qualify for world equestrian games my dream always before even Olympics was to ride in Aachen. So I really would love to ride in Aachen. Well, we'll all be keeping our eye out for those successes. That's going to be fun <laughs> to root for. Lots of good stuff on the horizon. Um, we've got some questions here uh, around, I'm going to try and kind of condense them into like a, a, a general category. Um, what is something, I mean, this for both of you, something as a youth rider, that everyone told you, but you didn't listen to, and you wish you had sooner. Uh, like, you know, everyone says that mm -hmm. you don't, but it can't be overstated. What's, what's your, what's your gem of knowledge here for our young riders? 
I don't have anything that, you know, they told me not to, but I remember very strongly. And I think that followed me even until a few years ago that um, people always said, how do I say that? Oh yeah, Sabine, she writes nice, but you know, it's like long and low and soft and that putting that a little bit maybe into a negative thing. And um, I don't regret that. <laughs> good, it's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. And maybe often, you know, I thought, hmm, maybe it made me a little insecure, but not anymore. Can but, you tell me the question again? Yeah, just kind of like a, like a what, you know, if you could only tell our young writers listening one, you know, one little tip, you know, to, to stick with that maybe doesn't get said enough, what, what would you recommend to keep in mind? Well, mm -hmm. the thing that comes to mind, work really, really, really hard, but also know when to take a break and finding the balance that's right for you is really, really, really important um, because you will have to work really, 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 really hard and it's gonna be really, really, really hard in ways you don't expect. Um, and just knowing, yeah, when, you know, just when, being, being, being smart. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Do you. Do you mind sharing uh, a little bit of what were the hard, the hard work that you didn't expect? What, uh, what might that look like, at least in your case? Um, well, I mean, you do put a lot of, like, you put a lot of hours in, in this business and you have to realize that even though maybe normally you do stop at six, I mean, I, I try to have decent hours. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I am busier than normally, and but I know it's positive biz, uh, busy, but I'm very big on a balance to come back because we have to give to the animals and you can't go there exhausted. You know, we owe that to them. And, you know, as we always say, even with a partner, you can only be good if you are in a good place. So, but, you know, you think you're done at six, but then the farrier shows up or like, even today I wasn't planning on going back, but then he called and said, you know, I could come now or tomorrow, but you know what I said, no, now. <laughs> so you go back and do it. So a little bit that, but Sophia is right. I, I see a lot in the business people that go nuts. And I, I don't think it's good because again, they may think they can do it, but you got to be good to your animals and you got to be in a good place. That's, you know, even writing, you do write with your, you know, with your mindset, if you're tired, you're not going to write well. If you're upset, I do think you have to watch that you are able to cut that out. So it's better if you're not upset and write <laughs> things like that. You know, it's, I think they get a little bit underestimated, but remember always like it's fascinating horses because they can feel a fly, right? And they do feel fear. And I do think they feel emotions. Even like if you have maybe a horse that's a little bit sassy and it needs a little bit more of a, a stronger mentoring or setting boundary rider, um, you need to leave the emotions out. And, and be clear and be giving clear instructions to your horse and tell them how to do that. So to not veer off too much, but it is an important aspect. And, and you know, you ask well, what, what makes it long, long? Well, those are the long hours, especially in Wellington. It's like, you have to work around a lot of other people's schedule. You know, saddle fitter, veterinarians, um, lessons, um, show schedule, because it is in one town, nobody leaves and is there and just does the show horses, you do the show and then you go home and write real quick at home and then maybe you teach somebody. So hours do get long. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely is one aspect. But um, also at the same time, I think, 
in this industry, it tends to be a mindset where if you're not working 20 hours a day, then you're not working hard enough. Kind true. Of thing. Well, and that's very true. It's very true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not necessarily <laughs> true, I don't think. Um, yeah, but that's a good point, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, this, this may lead to this next question or may not. I don't want to lead you anywhere. Um, but what uh, can you can you give some advice for our young riders um, on how you two got connected? Um, Sophia, how did you kind of go about becoming connected with Sabine and, and plotting your next, you know, your next uh, step in your career to get where you were? So my side of the story was Lendon called me. I was in her program last winter and she calls me and she goes, so what are you going to do after Wellington? And I said, <laughs> I'm going home to Maine. Thank you very much. And she said, well, don't you, do you want to work for someone else? And I said, only if it's the perfect person. And she said, well, I found the perfect person and you have to go work for them. And I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. When, and I asked uh, Lennon, <laughs> I'm looking for, you know, a good rider and yes, helping me also getting the horses ready and the care and management, but I have a small program. So I'm trying to not have too many horses. And then, because I know nobody's going to come to me and just take care of the horses. So I know the education is a big part too. Um, and so I contacted Landon and she said that she knew the one girl and uh, out of the program, but she didn't know if she was ready to leave Maine. <laughs> she, did, she, did, she did well. It was a she hard decision, but, yeah, but she <laughs> sold it very well. So our, our Maine members, I know who they are. They are very loyal Mainers. <laughs> Write that out first. <laughs> they are all on here also. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of the, the industry at large, it's not necessarily, are you telling the young, young riders who want to make this kind of a career move? It's not necessarily just the riding skills that get you where you go. Your, your real job is to take care of the horses and the riding is, is an evolving. Is that correct? Would that be the priority? Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. We've got, there are questions coming in faster than I can scroll. Um, let me see here. We've got um, a question that, oh, we have some gossip here. I hear you have a five-year-old Toto Jr. Any notes you'd like to share? If I uh, like to share anything about him. Yeah, so he's going to be <laughs> six this year and um, he's very cute, cute face. <laughs> heartbreaker face <Yeah. laughs> um what is his personality I mean he's well yeah there's a lot to talk about him I have rarely said on a warm blood that is so clear in the head and mind like I have I don't think I've ever had him spook at anything we're the drone over him you can tray ride him uh he can have I take weekends off. You can come Monday, just hop on. Um, you don't have to lunge or anything. Um, super, super easy going. Um, under saddle too, really, really willing. And um, just a good guy. He started breeding um, together. At the same time, we started breeding Senseo after Tokyo. So over the summer, he bred. Got a little more stylish, but just such a good guy. He waits and you tell him no, and he's like, okay. <laughs> um, and talented, definitely talented. Yeah, very exciting. And he's owned by Sandy Mancini up in Napa. And um, she's very supportive and wants to see him, you know, develop and shine. Obviously, she bought him with a vision. And so she's excited to see him develop and just be the best he can be. And Sophia ridden him um, a lot too. Mm -hmm. And she showed him at the, what was it? The stallion testing. He had to go to a testing in Santa Barbara, more Southern California. Mm -hmm. And she took him. And he was and perfect. Did a great, <laughs> great job. And he got approved for his registry or what they wanted to get him approved at and yeah did a great job 
really fun. So um, kind of to get down into the nitty gritty, um, another young rider is asking if you're, what's your day to day? Like, a, I know there isn't a normal day, but if, you know, we're looking for kind of a, a bit of balance, what's a typical day look like that's not unreasonable? Well, it's different in Florida versus California. Um, but right now I get to the barn at seven. We have two kids that I take full care of. I, so I start with them and I feed them and I check them over and I put them out and I clean their stalls. And then um, Sabine gets on to the at 8.15, almost every morning, you know, on the days that he works. Um, so I groom him and we do his stretches and all of his little things. And, um, and then I usually do some sort of chore while you're riding him, laundry or tidying things or finding things or whatever needs to be done. And then we sort of go through the list depending on the day, either riding or lessons or farriers or vets or whatever the day has. Um, and then Sincero goes for his little walks at noontime. One of us does that. And we continue with lessons or more horses in the afternoon and the kids come in and get their dinner and their, their stalls picked. And um, that's like kind of a normal day. And then there's like lots of other things sprinkled in depending on what's going on, but yeah yeah I would yeah again I keep the business small and then I also this um we're getting one more horse in from Spain but also I wanted Sophia to have some time to find a horse so I don't want to pack the day too full be and I try to make it easy because on the we do have to make a living too it's not like oh <laughs> this is all like fun so I have learned to make a little variety. I take, you know, rather more lessons in where then Sophia has more time to take care of the horses. And also she's not like, you know, I've been in, or well, I've never been in a situation like that, but I hear it a lot where just, it's like one horse after another, they get tacked up and it's, there is no really interacting with the horses and no time. like. I'm big on, I don't want just the brush over the horse. I really do believe in, you know, currying just for touching their bodies and a little bit massage. And yeah, just, I guess, old school. <laughs> um, really picking hoofs, you know, if there's no time, because I mean, that's also where the detail is. I, I have learned that a little bit too. Even for me, sometimes I like, I hate then bell boots because I never really take the time to look at my horse's feet, you know, because for me, I do go a little bit more one after another because I do the teaching then also. But again, it's important for me that for Sophia, it's not like just untacking and, and tacking up. And I, I want her to have time and have a relationship with the horses and the horses are happy and they feel there's somebody I'm sad that I can't be the person you know that I, we I, I love spending time with them and I really try to make time for Senseo um but yeah that's important so I um, think that's something for young riders to think about too is when you want to sort of go into this industry thinking about what sort of path you want to take and between Tanya and Sabine, I did do the job where you have 50 horses a day and you're grooming and it's very fast and you get a lot done and you have lots of clients and sales horses and all of that. And I decided that wasn't for me. And I think when you're thinking about sort of taking the next step and working for someone, think about really what's important to you and what you want to learn. And do you want to go into a sales barn or do you want to go into a competition barn or sort of thinking about what you could get the most from um, is something that I didn't think about when I was first looking for jobs. But then when I heard about Sabine and she said she had a small group, I was like, that's for me. Cause I liked I'm very meticulous. I like to, you know, take my time and really give attention to each of the horses. And so I get to do that working for her. That's, that's great. Thank you for that. I think it's it's important to make sure you have those those goals aligned as you go into the conversation with a potential move into a, an environment like that. Because if it 
you know, it's, if it's a, a busy day like that, there's a lot, if it doesn't match your personality and what you're there for, it can get, it can feel a lot, a yeah. lot heavier than it really is. So got a lot of questions. <laughs> um, what is your advice for young riders when they feel like nothing is improving? Patience. Yeah, they are <laughs> just slowly. <laughs> yeah. Really stay patient. I mean, yeah, I remember until a long, like, I think it was around 2004, I always thought I needed to quit because it didn't work for me. I wasn't good enough and I wasn't, and it's not that I think that now, but there was that, um, maybe, it, I don't want to say frustration, but like, how do I explain it? wasn't frustration but just like I wish I was doing a better job and now I'm much more at peace and it's still challenging because you know you maybe did it with one horse the other one shows you you know teaches you again new things but there's more more uh, peace in me and but what I'm trying to say with that it is really patience and and you know, I think people, I don't know, people think it's not, e it's not easy. I mean, to me, it's almost an art. It really is. Um, patience and it does take time. Maybe, I don't know, see, I don't come from a competition background, even though I already always competed as a kid, but never like high level. And I was very particular about the training. So, but I don't know, it's, it's it, maybe the competition sometimes makes it where you think you're not fast enough, you know, puts that perspective, the, maybe not the right perspective on it. So that's when you get frustrated because competing and I mean, like people always used to say, well, are you, you know, do you want to go to the Olympics? I'm like, yeah, I guess everybody would like to, but that's not my priority because a lot of stars have to align right. And there's a lot of things that I'm not in control over to go to the Olympics. So I don't want to have that mindset. And, and I think that's when maybe the frustration comes of, well, what do you do when nothing works? you know, look at it in a long-term goal. And, and it is difficult. It's, it's difficult, but not, I don't want to discourage difficult, you know, it's, it's not that, but. And it's important to say it wasn't the silver medal that gave you the peace right. where you were at, it came from. Yeah. Yeah. And a great ride at home, you know, and then if it didn't work in the ring, it's not always the outcome of what you did at home. I mean, a lot, yeah, but I think that comes especially later on as you get older. I think there's a lot of that too for young riders, like especially with social media, you're riding and you say, if I could only go to NAYC, then like I would just be so happy. Or if I could only do the Robert Dover clinic, then like then I would just be like so happy with myself, but that's not really how it works. Thank you both for that. Um, let's see, I'm gonna start kind of chewing through these. Um, so an, as an aspiring rider with an opinionated mare, was there ever a time mm. where you thought you would just never reach your goals no matter how hard you were trying? Difficulty with, the, with a horse, it, it sounds like. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> many times. Many times. Yeah. Not abnormal then. No. no, no. I think that again, goes back to looking at your goals, not necessarily being like a materialistic goal where like, I have to get 70% at fourth level or what, even though that is a good goal to have, but, or going to a certain event or doing a certain thing more having yeah. a smart goal, ask London about smart goals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, the. um, you know, you may, 
I mean, think about it. You said difficult mayor, right? So, you know, there's always a technical aspect. Well, how do you write a half test? How do you write a change? Or even, you know, you're a perfect for an eight or nine 20 meter circle, right? And perfect rhythm and balance. Um, but for a young rider, there's also the aspect of that mare being difficult. So you that you can only learn with time. There, you know, there might be the one young girl or boy that's maybe a, has a little better um, connection to that type of horse, meaning from the interior than the other boy or girl. But that's just life lessons the same as you have life lessons with humans. So, but it is a big aspect in training horses. So that maybe sometimes you feel you're behind or you're more disappointed or frustrated or unhappy, but you're, you're dealing with a certain horse personality that makes it more difficult for you as a youth, but you know, you just gotta, that, that one is gonna learn, teach you so much, you know? So it might seem maybe frustrating, but embrace it and, and you know, be smart about, and then there's, you know, your friend maybe has a schoolmaster. Well, put it in healthy perspective and be, you know, fair and good to yourself saying, well, I'm so happy for my friend to have a great schoolmaster, but I have my bratty mare. <laughs> Just gonna work with that. <laughs> and don't put yourself down because you have more difficulties to face because of that personality issue. Thank you. Um, I've got a comment here uh, from a barn owner who um, kind of going back to this uh, the idea that you know the horsemanship isn't really focused on in the young riding programs as much anymore at least from your perspective Sabine over time um and she's wondering from your perspective is it some is it kind of an environment that the barn owners themselves could help influence with the kids at their farm do you think that because of the social media you know that that outreach uh the look to the external that there's not really much to be done about it or is this something that barn owners can really kind of work to create a community and, and a culture in their barn for the youth riders to develop in that in that way? Yeah, I think that's definitely, you can do that. And I already hear from Sophia that she had that at Tanya's way more than what I hear often in other barns. No, I think definitely. And I see it myself too, um, but I'm guilty of, I have to pick and choose where I put my time. And again, recently with, with Tokyo preparing for it and the aftermath, <laughs> I lack time of it, but I'm very big. Like I often, I mean, I want to do tray rides together and no, there's so much. And I, I think, I feel like I have a lot of ideas, but I'm guilty of not following through with them because of what lately my life, when the direction my life took, but so to answer, yeah, barn owners, for sure, absolutely. I think that can be um, more embraced now. I, but I don't know, it takes one to um, get it going. But I also know if then the response doesn't come back, it can be frustrating. So I can only say I would have a lot of ideas, yes. But if people don't, Re respond to it I think then I would probably pull back at one point too it takes two sides you know um, a little bit in this country it's a little harder with the distance I will say you know especially kids they're depending on parents bringing them to the barn and it's really something I see in this country as I say I mean I have my bicycle and if I had a flat tire I walked and that was an hour to the barn um, but my mom would not drive me, <laughs> that was not. So it takes two sides, but it's definitely doable. I think something I hear a lot too is a lot of barn managers are afraid to have 
kids in their barn for liability issues. Oh my gosh, yeah. I can you know, see they that. don't want kids running around, yes. running around horses, you know, and then it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing because you don't want kids because they're a liability and you have to manage them. You have to keep an eye on them and, you know, they can do stupid things. But then also there's a shortage of working students and like kids don't want to be in the barn and work mm -hmm. so hard, you know, and it's kind of like, that's a very good point. Yeah, it's tricky. I had forgotten that was uh, when I had gone to Europe and seen like your traditional riding school that it was startling. There's, there's kids. It felt like Chuck E. Cheese to me. Cause it's, you know, yeah. Right around the ponies. No. So, yeah, yeah. And it was normal to fall off. But now it's like, oh my gosh, you get so scared of the falling off. Yeah. Like it was, and it was known that when kids fall, it's not as, I guess there are more, I, what do you call it? Um, they bounce better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like us, we fall like a sack of potato. <laughs> um, so no, I just remember falling off was not a big deal, but I see here also, like Sophia said, liability reasons. Uh, it's the same actually like with dogs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like I had to also explain barn owners. Um, I understand, well, I understand the liability, but I want my horses to be okay with dogs. I don't want them to be scared. And what does that take to have dogs around horses? But it's that whole liability thing, like Sophia said, it's a little difficult, but. Yeah, we have, we have a member commenting on, you know, that it's hard to find trail ride barns in the United States, same, you know. Yes. Well, I remember every Sunday we used to trail ride with a, like eight, nine in a group following. And then the first one would say, okay, trot. And then they all had to say trot. <laughs> really cute. Every Sunday. Yeah, it was fun. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to kind of cluster, cluster picture uh, questions and, and get everyone addressed here. Um, kind of shifting a little bit from uh, the development of the young rider we've been talking about back to the young horse. Um, tips for developing a young horse as you as a rider are also developing. Um, it feels often that there's not really any kind of um, like a, a steady ground to work off of. How do you recommend well, it's like, you know, it's known that normally <laughs> the younger rider should go on the more experienced horse and vice versa. So it is, I think, a little bit harder. Um, so the question was how to go about it, right? I think um, my advice would be to look a little bit into maybe an instructor that is willing and maybe also has some um, experience with young horses, you know, a little bit more where you look in the program and see, oh, wow, she likes or he developing young horses and then um, have a conversation with that trainer to see if they're um, perceptive of that combo. Like, you know, if they are like, don't believe in that combination, then obviously that's not a good place. But if there is someone you know, that's totally open to that because that's what you have to work with. It's just classically, normally people stay away from that. But I think, and I think most trainers would not, would be to okay with that. It, I don't mean by any means now to say that that's not what it should be. But I think the only, because that's a classical, like a saying, I would look for someone that's open to work with that and to get help. And also someone who's willing to sit on the horse too and sort Good of point. feel yes. issues. And also yeah. for me, when I got to ride some of Sabine's horses this summer, it always was a really big eye opener for me riding the horses the day after she got to ride them because I could sort of feel what you had worked on and you know, how they yeah. kind of felt different and how I can sort of work to achieve that feeling too. So I've got a couple of questions coming in around um, a, a couple of trends over time. So there seems to, uh, there's questions around um, the focus maybe now being too much on ribbons and, uh, you know, trying to get these accolades kind of lined up almost as if you've got a resume 
uh, as opposed to the, you know, just being at the barn and having fun and, and being a good horseman and then also horse person. And then also the um, idea about, um, my brain just completely blanked on me. Sorry, I lost it in the chat. Answer that one first. <laughs> If, if, uh, if, do you feel that, um, you know, that there's too much focus on the actual ribbons and the collecting of, of titles and things like that, as opposed to, or is that, you know, a good I think this would be good. Let's Sophia, because we come from different worlds. I mean, she's obviously with her people, her age, um, and older people like me. <laughs> and so it would be nice to hear her and me. It's too. Okay. Um, I don't think it's so much I hear, I mean, yeah, ribbons are nice. I hear more in the young rider group, people, especially like juniors and young riders wanting to do junior young riders and like that being the only goal and it's very important. And, you know, that's sort of the only thing that a lot of people focus on. And then you turn 20 or 21 and you think, it's not the biggest thing in the world and it's not the only goal you should have. And so, um, I mean, everyone wants ribbons. I like ribbons, but, and obviously, you know, you should be riding for fun, but as far as sort of the, I think obsessive thinking um, was the question maybe, I definitely it's centered around. I think for me, junior young riders is what I hear the most, um, which is to say that it's not a really good competition that people should strive to compete in because it's an amazing experience. Um, but people shouldn't feel like they're a failure because they either don't get there or don't do well. That's a good point. Yeah, because also sometimes some kids or younger people have the opportunity because you do need the right partner for that. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And not everybody has that. So I think what Sophia said there was really important that you it doesn't make you any less it's and such a still, small part of your life, those like 10 years or whatever yeah. that you're a young rider. So. so I think it's an, yeah, individual um, decision. And also, uh, you know, if you have the opportunity or not. Thank you. Um, we've got a question for Sophia specifically. Do you have, uh, did you have to make a decision between going to college? I, I believe I saw your father on the call earlier. Um, so <laughs> did you have to make a decision between going to college or becoming a working student? What was that like trying to work through that, that choice? So for me, the sort of defining moment was when I got spotlight because he was a stretch for our budget and, um, he definitely ate into my college tuition savings. <laughs> and we were sort of sitting around the kitchen table. And I was like, I really want this horse, I really want this horse. And my parents were like, okay, you either get this horse and like you stick, I mean, not to say you can't do something else, but like you either stick with it and like you go hundred percent or you do college and like whatever else that people do. Like you can't do the horse thing. And then also all of the other things that people do, you know, and so obviously I chose the horse thing and I don't regret it for a second. Um, but that sort of getting the horse took up the money and then also being a working student took up the time for school and things like that. Um, and I, I definitely don't regret it. Um, did you have moments where you questioned it? Was there ever a time? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely think I would really enjoy going to college. I wasn't, ever, I was not a good student, but I didn't hate school. Um, I really liked learning, especially when I had really good professors. I did do one semester at college and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and maybe someday when I have the time and money, I'll go and take some classes just to learn more. But for me, I don't feel like I need a degree. And I know a lot of people say you should have a degree to fall back on. Um, but I also hear a lot, maybe if you have something like that to fall back on, you're more likely to take the easier route. And for me, I wanna sort of be in this 110%. And I feel like if I have this other thing sort of linger in the back of my head, I won't be as focused maybe. I think that's very, you know, depending on, 
each person. Um, I definitely know lots of young professionals that have degrees in various things and are very happy with that and happy to have something to, happy to have that sort of in the back of their mind. Um, but for me, I like being very focused on what I'm doing. And I always thought too, like courses are something that I think it's best to do when you're young and spry and fit. <laughs> um, <True. laughs> and yeah. college you can do when you're older. Like my mom went to grad school when she was in her forties, now fifties, she's going to get her PhD, I think. Her. And, um, you know, you can do that. You can do online classes these days. You don't have to be in school and, um, you know, it, it, the, there's no one way to do things. Well, I really appreciate both of your time. We are, we have gone two minutes over. So I know, we, wow. we, I know it went fast, doesn't it? Um, so I think Karen's going to come back on and, and join us for our, our kickoff. Thank you both very much. Thank that you. was fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Sabine and Sophia. It was so insightful and so down to earth, so realistic, so much wisdom. Um, really appreciate you taking the time and and um, chatting with us. So thank you so much. Um, thank, you just, so much. thank you. And just a reminder to membership, um, look for your email for next week registration. It's going to be um, Kim Gentry and she's going to talk about bits, um, the use of them, what they're for, what they do, how they fit, et cetera, et cetera. So that will be a really um, something to look forward to. I, I don't you, ever look forward. I never look forward to the bit sessions because I never know how to pronounce the things that everyone's asking questions about. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. well, thank you, everyone. Very thank much. You. Thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Have a Bye. great day.